Welcome to the Retirement Daily Learning Center. Our topic today is why would an advisor talk about reverse mortgages with their clients? Our speakers today are Matt Kerfman. Matt Kerfman's personal mission is to help people maintain, use, and grow their wealth so they may pay it forward to their family, and friends, and communities. He is a certified financial professional at the registered investment advisory firm of Richmond Brothers, which is based in Jackson, Michigan. Don Graves. Don is president and founder of the Heckam Institute for Housing Wealth Studies and an adjunct professor of retirement income at the American College of Financial Services. And our last speaker is Ed Slott. Ed is a nationally recognized IRA and retirement planning distribution expert, best-selling author, and professional speaker. His latest book is The New Retirement Savings Time Bomb. Gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. Hello there. My name is Matt Kerfman, and I am here with two uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, and uh, along with uh, Bob Powell, we have Don Graves and Ed Slott, and we're going to talk to you today about why an advisor would talk about reverse mortgages uh, with their clients, and we know that a lot of you watching may or may not work with advisors. You may do some things on your own, so our goal today is education and more content, so you can take some action steps coming out of this presentation. So uh, we will move forward and move into this. We'll present for about 30 to 35 minutes. And then uh, Bob is uh, watching in the background. And at the end, uh, he may have some questions uh, that he's received from some of you uh, or that he just wants. And then this will go live on uh, his website. So thanks for uh, attending and watching. Real quick disclosures, um, I am part of a registered investment advisory firm, so as with everything, we're not giving any concrete advice uh, to you today. Um, consult with the appropriate uh, legal counsel, uh, the appropriate accounting firms, uh, everyone else to make sure you're getting uh, accurate advice for your situation. So as we jump into this, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, Don. Don, this is a topic that you and I have uh, become um, very close on. And we met through our mutual friend, uh, Ed Slot several years ago. Uh, and really the question today is why talk about uh, reverse mortgages? There, there's a case study here that you can bring up, Bob and Sally. And I want to start there and then kind of swing out from that, that they're 65 preparing for retirement. They don't have a lot, but neither do they have a little. They've got $500,000 in IRA. And we've learned from Ed Slot that's where most retirement is but they, like most retirees, boomers, have a home. Their home is valued at $500,000 and they have no mortgage. And that's going to be the backdrop. Now, for some of you listening, your house may be way more than that. My family's from Falmouth, Kentucky, and we, we hadn't seen a $500,000 house until about the year 2017. And so depending on where you're at, you may or may not have seen this, but the principles will apply. But Matt, from this, um, the, the question is why? Um, talk about reverse mortgage, why are advisors talking about it? Why should clients pay attention? We're going to see today from this Bob and Sally, there are five conversations um, we can have, or you can have, and Ed, we're going to talk about the long-term care solutions. You can move the slide, um, some bridging strategies, risk management, tax management, and mortgage management. And so as we talk about reverse mortgages, some things often come up and move to the next slide, Matt. I'm going faster than you're moving, <laughs> but we'll talk about reverse mortgages, uh, real life conversations and example. We're going to park there because that's where the, the heart is and then some Q&A. But for 21 years, uh, I've been involved with reverse mortgages um, through various entities. I've, as a practitioner and I've had 16,000 consumer facing conversations and about 3,000 people want for it to become my client. And all that tells the consumer is that as good as reverse mortgages are for many, we know they're not always the right thing to do. So I never know if it's right or not. In my work with the American College, um, there's a, some content I created for the RICP designation, and there are 23,000 financial advisors working their way through that. So over 21 years, here are some of the concerns that have come up that when you mention reverse mortgages, oh, they're too complicated. Who could understand them? They're too controversial. I don't, I don't know. I see bad stuff about them. They're too expensive. One fellow advisor said to me, they're equity strippers. I told him, I don't go to clubs like that. What did he mean? And he says, it doesn't leave any money left <laughs> to the family or the children. I said, oh, wait a minute, just hold on. Maybe something's different. My clients have never asked. My clients would never need 
or sometimes I've heard this, this is most popular, that reverse mortgages should only be used as a last resort. And that was popularized by FINRA, um, the Financial Regulatory Agency, until 2013, they changed that position. And so lots has changed, but here's where we want to focus today. Bob and Sally, and, and, and I'll tell you, um, because I want to really focus, let you and Ed talk about some of this. I created, I recorded a video filmed at the American College that spends time unpacking the basics of the reverse mortgage. Bob Powell in the street, they've done so much great work on that. We want to get into the the, the nitty gritty. Matt, talk about um, Bob and Sally here, please. And then how the reverse mortgage applies. And I'll come back and explain a little bit how we got some of these figures. Sure. Thanks, Don. One thing I would just add that as a uh, certified financial planner, as a master lead advisor through Ed Slot for going on 15 years, up until about two or three years ago, I was one of those people on that last category that thought, oh, this is probably something only for a last resort only. And one thing I thought would be really good to connect to the audience is every single time in the last two years, I have even broached the topic of this word. The very first thing that comes up is a commercial that everyone is very familiar with, with an old celebrity named Tom Selleck. So if you ask, are we uh, talking about that same topic? The answer is yes, but we're not just talking. We're going to educate you, go through some real life examples, and then Ed is here with us uh, as well. So Don put this together, and you know, there's so many examples of how many, how much in dollars people have in their IRAs, their 401ks, uh, depending on where you live, what the home value uh, is worth. And so I started to read Don's book and I could identify at least nine out of every 10 clients that I work with in or around those retirement years um, should know about this. Doesn't mean it's right for everyone, but I got uh, kind of goosebumps when I started thinking about all the value that I could add by getting educated myself and then actually using Don as a resource if someone wanted to take it further uh, to really go through the process. And, and the one um, myth that I will just throw out there four words, and Don uses these often, it's just a mortgage. So I'm going to repeat that. It's just a mortgage. And I'm saying that twice because it needs to really sink in. We're, make, we're going to make it sound way more simple than it is, but everything you know about a mortgage is still true. But there's some bells and whistles that are specially in these programs for retirees. So uh, with that, uh, I just told uh, Don and Ed, I had a client uh, two weeks ago, actually, and they came in and it's, it's very much the Bob and Sally and they feel like they had enough money to retire on. They felt great that they paid off their mortgage, um, but Sally's parents right now, she was helping with their long-term care. And all she was seeing was the current expense that was flowing out of her parents' portfolio and her parents' income sources, social security and other. And they still needed uh, money for, the, for her dad to live on while they were paying for mom's care. So even though they're newly retired, you know, there's a lot of different approaches you can take with respect to chronic illness and long-term care. But to oversimplify it, you either hope that nothing ever happens, which is not a good plan. I don't think hope is a good plan. Uh, you can self-insure and you can hope that you have enough assets to cover those risks. You can look at long-term care insurance. Uh, you can look at hybrid life insurance that has accelerated living benefits. And I think one thing that's always left out of this discussion is you could look at reverse mortgages. And so we're gonna kind of dive into that because even if you qualify for, and, and you know you want the long-term care uh, or you know you want hybrid life insurance, just because you want it doesn't mean you can get it. And so we ran into a case where one spouse applied and got approved, the other spouse got denied. So we had to go to backups and say, well, what other tools are out there to help solve for this? So we just talked about rolling the dice. We're really not looking at getting going into a casino and doing some planning together with all of you. And you know, to Don's credit, you know, he asked me when I first met him, Matt, are you committed to talking to your clients about using all available assets to come up with the most successful retirement income plan and to de-risk things that could show up down the road that they don't have to deal with now? What are all available assets? Don, back to you. <laughs> Well, I, I want to, we're going to go to Bob and Sal. I want to explain uh, the next slide is that the reverse mortgage has been around in America since 1961. It's been under the auspices of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development since 1988. So 33 years, it's, it's had a long time. And so 
the, the basis of a reverse mortgage, it's, it's a loan. It's just a mortgage. It's a home equity loan that allows retirees age 62 or better to convert a portion of their home's value, turn it into tax-free dollars without giving up ownership, coming off title, or being required to make monthly mortgage payments. Now, here on the screen, what you notice is Bob and Sally. Uh, the, we determine the benefit amount in this illustration based on three things. I'll, I'll draw a little triangle here. and um, Age of the youngest spouse, number two, the value of the home, and number three, the current interest rate. And um, so those three things determine the initial benefit amount. A reverse mortgage must be a first mortgage. So if there's a mortgage, it has to be paid off, and we'll see that later. So you notice here, column A says that Bob and Sally are eligible for $224,000. Let me unpack this, and then I want to come um, to Matt and Ed, because this is quite significant. This is something that most people don't understand, columns A, B, and C. So column A says uh, Bob and Sally are eligible to receive a reverse mortgage line of credit of $224,000. That line of credit has a built-in guaranteed growth factor, cannot be frozen, canceled, capped, or reduced as long as they're meeting the obligations of the program, which are one of them has to live in the house, take care of it, pay their taxes, and keep insurance in force. Four things are already doing. So this reverse mortgage line of credit is unlike a home equity line of credit, because notice column A, when, once we reach age 75, it's grown from 224 to 351. If we go all the way down here, to age 90, where my mama's close to that, it's $720,000. So the first thing to notice is the unused portion of a reverse mortgage has a built-in guaranteed line of credit growth factor. Column B says that in any given year, any given year, if you wanted to turn on that money to create uh, revenue, you could turn it on. This is how much you would get for as long as you're living in the property. Column C says, well, what if I just wanted money for a certain period of time? And it can be any period of time, three years, 11 years, 15 years. We're just using a five-year period of time here. And you notice that the first, uh, if you did it in the first year, it's $4,160. But as I go back to Matt, here down um, at age 85, you'll notice that that line of credit, the client wants to turn it on now. They let it sit for 20 years. They said, I need money for just five years. I can get $10,216. Now, my mom is age 88. And um, so she's right in that wheelhouse. So now that that kind of unpacks the front end of the reverse mortgage. Matt and Ed, why? Knowing this, Matt, going back to Bob and Sally, they had a concern. And, and we'll talk about um, tax management and, and a few other things. But Matt, just back to the uh, long-term care consideration, how does the reverse mortgage play into that type of conversation for an advisor? Thanks, Don. There is just a lot more information on the screen than you'd ever imagine what we could, we're, we're Don and, and Ed and I can take this. And I'll, I'll, I'll clarify a few simple points. One, the LOC in column A, that's a line of credit. So many of you remember I said, it's just a mortgage. A lot of people are familiar with the term home equity line of credit. This is a similar version. It's a line of credit through this program. And so that's the starting base. If you remember, Bob and Sally had a $500,000 home value. So the line of credit started at 224 grand. So it's not an exact science. It depends on a few factors, but roughly speaking, if you have between 50 and 60% equity in your home, that's really what a great spot to be to come into this program. And that's how you're able to establish this line of credit. Second column B where it says 10 year payment. Uh, this is a very simplistic view, but that is a lifetime income stream to you. So for example, if at age 74, you decided you didn't have enough income and you went over to column uh, row 74, 335,000. You could turn on a monthly income stream for the rest of your life tax-free. And this is where I'll bring Ed in, $1,820. Similar on the long-term care piece, Don, that you mentioned, most people uh, statistically will end up in a chronic illness situation between somewhere in the ages of, of 80 and 85. And if their portfolio was still $500,000 in value because they've been living off of it all these years, but now one spouse is chronically ill, it's not unreasonable for the cost to exceed uh, $10,000 a month. And so Ed, if I could bring you on here, if I, were, if I had a 401k or an IRA and I needed to fund $10,000 per month to pay for my chronically ill spouse's care, how much roughly do I need to take out of my IRA or 401k to solve for that? Well, a lot of that would be taxable. But again, you might have an offsetting medical deduction. 
But you never know. They keep changing the rules on these things. Now it has to exceed seven and a half percent. So it's not an exact wash. Plus, you're taking down that retirement money. And the last thing you want when you have expenses like that is to add another one called taxes. So uh, this gives you access to tax-free money, like a Roth IRA. And the other thing is, you don't know what future taxes might be. I believe they're going to be much higher, especially after this year, with uh, all the changes being proposed. Uh, it's pretty likely, I mean, I don't have any inside information, but it's pretty likely taxes won't go down for most people. So it's pretty likely they'll either stay the same, somewhat the same, or go up, or go up a lot. And if they go up a lot, just when you need the money most, in retirement, you're becoming sick, you need the long-term care, uh, the last thing you want is to add an extra tax expense. It's like salt in the wounds. This is another source. It's critical to have multiple sources of tax-free money. We always thought of the Roth IRAs, life insurance, some life insurance policies do have long-term care riders, but as I think you said earlier, not everybody qualifies for that. So this is another sort of arrow in your quiver. You know, you have to have all the tools available and now is the time to do it. When I say now, as early as possible, it's like uh, when you go to the bank for a loan, the worst time to go to the bank for a loan is when you need the money. <laughs> That's when you'll never get a loan. It's the same thing here. Don't wait till there's a big problem. Now, that's why it's called planning. You're just planting seeds and having alternatives available to you. Other tax tools on that tax tool ball. I have a quick question here for Don and Ed, and then we'll move forward. Let's say that uh, I were Bob, in Bob and Sally's situation. I set up this line of credit with the, the, the idea that I was going to use this as a tool for long-term care expenses. If one of us became sick down the road, we get to 85. We're both healthy as can be. We think we're going to live another 10 years. Um, I'm not committed to using that money for long-term care, right? I can pull that money out, income tax-free, for anything I desire. Is that right, Don? That's correct. And on this screen, one of the things, um, and you said it earlier, th this simple chart has so much to it. And, and I've got Ed's book back here, and, and I just love Ed. And so I've learned so much about IRAs and, that I didn't know that I didn't know. But certainly, um, it, the dollars come out tax-free. And so to, to go back to the Bob and Sally, just the long-term care concept, it's the biggest overlooked planning expense in retirement. Many advisors are concerned about it. So what do you do? Well, here's an example where they can self-insure. Age 85, 90, where my mom is, if she set this up 20 years earlier, this is a type of self-insurance. Or maybe they had some um, long-term care or some sort of life insurance, but it's not going to be enough. So this becomes a co-insurance. It also begins a, a framework for policy architecture that on a typical long-term care plan there, um, the policy premium is going to be based on the benefit amount, how much are you going to get, how long are you going to get it, uh, what's the inflation rate um, associated with it, what's the waiting period, how long are you going to wait before they turn it on. With having something like what you see on the screen in place, if you say, well, my waiting period is going to be um, six months, that means the premium on a traditional policy is going to be very low. But the question is, well, Don, where would I get the money to wait six months before I turn it on? Well, column A tells you how to, how to do that. So there's all types of conversations that you can have just around long-term care. And, but the taxation, I, I want Ed to, to jump in here because this is where I think is really an overlooked planning um, and we can skip ahead a slide or so, but Ed, you talked about your, your three concepts of um, um, never taxed and, and uh, but talk, go back to that Forever slide. Never taxed to never tax. I yeah. love tax-free. To me, anything tax-free means you keep more of your hard-earned money. But the problem is with this right. whole area, and I even overlooked this until I started really getting into this because I saw all these old commercials years ago, and I had that slant in my head until I really got to know Don and others, and I saw how these reverse mortgages have really changed. In fact, I, I said that on the cover of Don's book right here. Uh, right here on the top, if you can see, I said my concerns were addressed. 
I really felt good about these things. It says my concerns were addressed. The new world of retirement strategies was open. It got it made available more assets when people need them during their lifetime. So many times they go through life and they don't get to use assets that have real value. You know what this reminds me of? I may be too old for you guys. Maybe not Bob. He's about my same age there. But when I was growing up uh, in our living room, which we were never allowed in unless there was company. But in our living room, my mother had this big couch and two chairs. I never actually sat on any one of them uh, directly without a plastic cushion over them. Ever, that's what they bought. They bought these plastic, I forget what they were called, these plastic things. So you would sit on the, you, know, you would sit on the plastic, even the company sat on the plastic. Uh, so you never felt yourself kind of sink into the cushion. So, uh, and it, they never came off until after my mother died. I mean, so I'm thinking like this, she never really got the enjoyment or the use out of it because she was always so worried of somebody touching it. Uh, and this hits me like that. You have this house, this asset, maybe it's a giant sofa, if you want to look at it that way. That's Imagine if your whole house was covered in plastic. At some point, you want to use the thing and it's yours. Uh, that's the key to this whole area. Get the most out of every asset you have. And in this example that Don and Matt put together here, I think the, if you go back, was it 500,000 and 500,000? Was that the example, guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so half of the net worth equity was not even being used when they needed money. And this opened up my eyes to where, you know, where you can get at that money without a commitment on the back end. Yes, eventually the beneficiaries will have, uh, have less to inherit. But I always tell uh, clients when I speak to them, don't worry so much about them. They will have plenty. And one thing Don taught me, uh, I, I think, Don, you said this, you, uh, not an official statistic, but a Don Graves type statistic, okay? Uh, very close, but not exact. Uh, Don told me 99% of parents think their children want to live in their house after they die. And 99% of children do not want to live in that house. I can they attest to, to that, Ad. What's that? I can attest to that. Right. Was that your unofficial statistic, Don? Did I get that? It was, it's very close. Uh, <laughs> after with 3,000 clients, I've had a lot of people die in 21 years. <laughs> so, yeah. So in other yeah. words, you're not saving it for anybody. They don't want that. They just want whatever's left. And they're happy to have you use it because you know what? If you're not using it, the last thing a parent wants to see is their children fighting over who's going to take care of mom. She's out of money, but she's not out of house. And Ed and, uh, Ed and Don, thank you. Here is, uh, I know Ed, you held up your uh, the book here. Here's a copy of that yeah. on the screen. And then as a resource for those of you that are watching, Don has a website that you want to take down so that you can go get more and more information from a really trusted resource. And I will add, but I'll let Don come. And I believe this is all free information that Don has put together. This is free. Ed, Ed was gracious. He read my first book and he said, Don, would you write a smaller book? And um, and I'd made the first ones. I'm simple. I'm Kentucky simple. But I'm so glad that we did. And this has just been um, it's a short read, but we've packed everything in there. So housingwealthbook.com, you can get it. And Housing Wealth videos um, just takes you um, right to a resource that I recorded um, at the American College. And it's just 57 minutes. It's for consumers, but advisors benefit from that as well. But Ed mentioned something. Matt, go to the next slide. So we talked about um, long-term care solutions, but there's also this concept of um, bridging strategies and risk management and tax management. So let, let's all talk about that here. One of the things when I spoke for Ed, um, we were talking, that there's a client who said, and this has to do with bridging strategies. Uh, an advisor said, Don, my client's turning 65 in February, and they want to turn on Social Security, but we'd like to have them postpone it for five years and get it till 70, and that Social Security benefit will grow at 8%, and they've got a, an annuity that has a vesting schedule, and they, if they don't turn it on, that will grow at 7% as an old annuity, and then we want their IRA 
to grow until 70. And they said, we plugged it in our software. And if we could just bridge that, um, that's going to be an extra $665,000 to their account. And we heard that you had a way to bridge it. So I showed them something that looked like this. And, I, and again, I said, I'm so glad I, I knew Ed because I didn't know what I didn't know when I told him this. And I said, sure, if you take that from 65 to 70, we can turn on this reverse mortgage line of credit. Here's a five-year term. That's $4,160 that they can get for five years to cover that gap that gives them such a bigger benefit later. And the advisor got a little sad. He says, oh, I don't know if that's going to be enough. And here's where my Ed slot, you remember um, um, Fred Flintstone had that little guy that sat on his shoulder. I forgot his name back when I was a kid. A kazoo, I think his name was. And I heard Ed Slot saying, Don, he doesn't know that these are tax-free dollars. So I said to the advisor, I said, well, how much would it take if he's pulling that money from his IRA at his current tax rate? How much would he have to pull out to, to equal that number? Because they were saying, well, he needs $5,000 a month. Well, it turned out, according to where he was living, that he was going to have to pull out more to net $4,160. So this was better because these dollars come out tax-free. And so that was a real no-brainer. But here's the thing to, to you and, and Matt in particular. Um, why? Because some advisors say I'm reluctant to talk about reverse mortgages. Matt, why do you think it's important for advisors to talk about reverse mortgages? And, and Ed can jump in as well. And Ed, you already said a little bit, but Matt, I didn't hear from you. Why is that important? Well, Don, I would, I would say a couple of things. Uh, one of the phrases I remember from my very early days with uh, Ed and his group being trained as an advisor um, in, in these sorts of concepts, he said, you don't know what you don't know. And I was guilty of that. I didn't know what I didn't know. And as soon as I do know it, and you start to look at these really uh, not complicated strategies, but very powerful strategies that can benefit so many of my clients they can benefit my clients, they can benefit anyone's, um, retirees, ages, all these sorts of things, getting up to 62 and beyond. And these concepts are really phenomenal integrating in as part of an overall comprehensive plan. And I love tax-free. Ed taught me that a long time ago. So to complement something that I was already doing in my practice to help clients with, whether it be life insurance or various other insurances or lots and lots of Roth conversions, this is just another strategy that I was not educated at the level I should have been because there's a lack of good information out there or, or we see a commercial, we read a bad article and someone says they lost their home to a reverse mortgage. And you and I talked about this the other day, Don, if you read about 24 paragraphs into all of these articles that are in public facing media, um, person didn't lose their house to reverse mortgages. Almost, they lost it, they didn't pay their property taxes four years in a row. What would happen right now in your traditional house with a traditional mortgage if you didn't pay your property taxes for four years? Remember, it's just a mortgage. So Matt, uh, what are you, the advisor, because you're a certified financial planner, that's a high standard, that's a fiduciary standard to do what's in the best interest of your client. If you had a client that had a home and a mortgage, as Ed mentioned, that's such a substantial part of their total wealth and you're you're developing a, an income strategy. If an advisor does not look at the house, are they doing what's in the best interest of their client in your regard? Whether the reverse mortgage is the right tool or strategy to use. If you're not, if you don't know any of the tools or strategies that can be used, are you really being a fiduciary? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I, I take the approach that I would like my clients and whether they end up working with me or not, I would like them to have all the knowledge base that they possibly can so they can make better and informed decisions for their own personal uh, financial well-being. And so that's really where these have been eye-opening to me in the last uh, three or so years that, that we've been uh, coordinating and collaborating on these. So with the uh, thought of time here, and, and we've kind of set the foundation of how the line of credit gets set up, we have a couple other topics that piggyback onto this. And mm -hmm. so I would suggest if we can, let's keep moving forward and kind of- Well, let's talk about the tax management strategy uh, because when I first wrote my book, and, and um, we'll come back to the buffer asset in a moment, but go to the tax management strategy. And 
the, the first time I wrote the book, I didn't know Ed, and I learned about Roth conversions, and I added the added a whole chapter. It's been probably the most successful thing I've done. So here's that same client, um, and they've got this line of credit, $224,000, and we're going to show this line of credit growing 4.5% per year. It's not always that. Sometimes it's significantly more. But what we did is to say they had a half a million dollars. And let me say this. I am not a financial advisor. So the strategies that are shared, please consult with Matt or Ed or someone in that realm. So this is all anecdotal. But Matt, as we worked through this in Ed, we said, if a client wanted to convert, let's say $500,000 over to tax-free money, they could, this shows them converting $100,000 a year. And Matt, you said, we don't want to do too much because they, they can't get above 176,000. There's some number yeah. we were saying. But we said, okay. And I said, well, Matt, what would the taxes be on that roughly? And he said $24,000 a year. So notice what this does. The, the line of credit started, it grew by $10,000. And then the client did a Roth conversion for 100,000. And the taxes on that Roth were paid from the growth of the line of credit. The next year, the line of credit um, grew again. They did a conversion and they did that for five years. So at the end of five years, They've converted all $500,000 from um, taxable money to tax-free. They used the line of credit from the reverse mortgage's growth to do that. And then at the beginning of the sixth year, they still have $147,000 left in the line of credit. And that continues to grow. And why is this an important conversation to at least have or to know about for your advisors? Well, because they, there is essentially no tax. Now you said there is a tax, but it's being paid from essentially the equity in the home through the reverse mortgage. So it's almost like you're uh, taking a little bit of the home each year and turning it into a tax-free Roth IRA at essentially no tax. Now I'm not saying there's no tax, there is a tax, but you're using tax-free funds, other tax-free funds. It doesn't impact the net the net invested accounts. Meanwhile, you have a Roth now here in this example growing, you have 500,000 bucks, not uh, reduced by taxes at all, growing tax-free. And that too, eventually, uh, if it's needed, can be withdrawn tax-free. So you're leveraging the home into a tax-free vehicle. Then you have uh, even more in the, the line of credit available tax-free. Plus now you have the Roth tax-free. That's the kind of thing I was talking about before. Having, you know, these books where they say you have to have multiple streams of income. This is kind of like that, but it's this is way better. You have to have multiple uh, uh, pots of tax free money. And that's what you get here. So essentially, the money uh, is coming from the house to pay the tax on the Roth conversion. Don and Ed, if I can add a quick question just for the audience, just to clarify, as we go deeper into these topics, let's say that I was I had this 500 grand. And I over five years, I had a strategy, I want to convert all of it, I use the line of credit, we get to the end of uh, 69, I've now converted, let's just say for illustrative purposes, all 500 grand. All of that gets into the Roth. So basically everything in my Roth now continues to earn investment re yields based on my own allocation strategy for the rest of my life, tax-free. There's two things I wanted to highlight. One, Don, you mentioned upper income thresholds of about 176. All we're referencing there is a married filing joint couple. If you pull a large amount from an IRA over to a Roth and you already have other income, you know, uh, pension, uh, uh, social security, you wanna pay attention to what happens with your Medicare premiums if you exceed those thresholds. So we just, we don't wanna just blindly convert 500 grand in one year without being aware of these other tax triggers. And that's what Don was mentioning. And then second, the new required minimum age when you have a tax deferred account, a 401k and IRA, is now age 72. So guess what? When Bob and Sally now get to 72, they have absolutely zero required minimum distributions. Why? Because their 500 grand is now in a Roth IRA. The government no longer cares about because they don't get any tax revenue anymore when you withdraw from that. So hopefully you can start to pick up uh, as a viewing audience on, on some of these I would suggest are really phenomenal and home run strategies and how you can integrate this in because unless you had 24,000 times five sitting in the bank that you were willing to part with, 
I think using your housing wealth as a strategy is a pretty strong one. And one last quick point, Don, if I took this 24 grand out of my line of credit on my reverse mortgage every year for five years, mm-hmm. obviously I'm using the money. So I now kind of have a note or a loan outstanding. Mm-hmm. What most people don't catch on to is I don't have to make a monthly payment on that. Mm-hmm. That is the beauty. So it's not affecting my monthly cash flow. I'm welcome to make a monthly payment if I feel guilty about it, but I'm no longer required to in this program. These are some of the bells and whistles where it goes outside of, you know, beyond it's just a mortgage. There's some really neat features that are available for, I I use the term retirees. Absolutely, Matt. And and I want to pay attention to our time. I want to, Matt, can I go to the mortgage management? Yeah, absolutely. um, Because of time. So Bob and Sally here, we, we've just made them 2.0 and they've got a um, $200,000 mortgage on the property. I think there's a zero missing, but they're making a $1,500 a month payment. This is important because that's where most baby boomers live. Think of all the people you know, last time you were in a room filled with homeowners that were age 55 or older. How many of them had a mortgage, second mortgage, home equity loan or home equity line of credit? At least one of them on their property, the last barbecue you was at. That's a big number. That's a big number. And so the majority, so what do you do? So the mortgage management looks at Bob and Sally, and here's my favorite question of 2020 and 2021. I say, Bob and Sally, since you're already making a payment of $1,500 a month, you're already doing that. If you had a choice, would you rather your payment be mandatory or voluntary? Well, most people look at me a little befuddled and say, duh, voluntary. And I say, would you want to see how that works? That's what Many advisors are asking their clients, that's what you all may be watching. Do, are you carrying a mortgage payment? Would you rather be mandatory or voluntary? Now, look what happens to Bob and Sally. We'll take the same next slide. So instead of getting $224,000, they get $24,000 because we paid off their mortgage. But we said to them, they said, Don, we'd like to still make a mortgage payment. I said, Bob and Sally, Don, I want you to keep making that payment of $1,500 a month like you had been doing. But here's what happens. So it's voluntary. They don't have to make it, but they do make it. Notice what happens to column A, the line of credit. It's replenishing itself. So the same strategies can be used. The next slide gives you a visual glide path of what that looks like. So the first slide is what they, over to the left, is what they had when they had a regular mortgage. They were making a payment and the loan balance went down and eventually was paid off. The reverse mortgage says, well, you can, Um, Do the same thing, but if ever you needed to pull some of that money back out again, you can always pull it back out again. And that's an example of taking what you already had and optimizing it just because you had a very different conversation. So long-term care strategies, bridging strategies, risk management, go back to that, tax management and mortgage management. So let's end on uh, Dr. Wade Fowle, research, Matt, and we'll close out on that. And Bob, you could come back. The point is, um, there are 42 strategies, 42 named strategies um, that I, I talk about in the book and, and Ed has helped me. I didn't have some of them before I met Ed and, and Matt's helped me with some of that. But go back to that um, risk management slide, um, Matt. It was the Ed um, way back in the beginning. <laughs> so keep going. But in this, as Matt keeps going back, the one more. Great. So here, here's the idea, other way. So here's the concept of the, the buffer asset strategy. Matt, you want to pick up here and we'll get our seats in the upright position. I think this is a wonderful place to end because it's mind boggling. Sure. Yeah. So let's say that, uh, again, this is just going down another path that you could consider if you were looking at a reverse mortgage in a very creative way. Let's say you had your $500,000 portfolio and you retired and you retired into a recession, not knowingly, it happened after you retired, you invested too aggressively and you had negative years in your portfolio. And so this is basically illustrating that over a long period of time. Let's say three years into retirement, the market was down, I was too heavily invested, but I'm retired and I still need my portfolio to take income from. So this just goes back and basically suggests that in the year after a down market year, stop taking a draw from your 401k, your IRA, that's now lost value, and instead pivot over to that reverse mortgage line of credit. And for that year, take tax-free disbursements from that. So you're still getting income, 
hopefully that buys time to let your portfolio recover uh, because you're not also taking out of it. And then look at what happens. And, and Don and, and Ed, you can cut, uh, basically pipe, pipe in here. I, I don't know if you want me to go to the next slide to show the magic. Well, well this says if, if a client had a, a non-correlated buffer asset, a volatility buffer of some sort that they could draw from versus taking assets from the um, investment account, giving a chance to recover over a 30 year period, instead of the, the dollars going to zero, if they just use that bucket one time, one time in 30 years, the retained asset would be anywhere between 800,000 and 1.4 um, million. Next slide. But what Dr. Wade Faust said was, well, what if they had this um, volatility buffer, this side asset, and they were able to use it four times in 30 years, instead of running out of money in 30 years, which would be great, and most people think I didn't do too bad, they'd have $4 million left over if they just used it four times. And so that speaks to the, the thought that people say, well, reverse mortgages are an equity stripper. Remember I said that earlier, it's not gonna leave any money to the kids or the family. And I said, what if it was set up in such a way that left them $4 million more million? Would that be okay? <laughs> and sometimes what people confuse is that, mama asked me, would you rather have the apple tree or the orchard? Now we were simple folks, Bob, but uh, I said the orchard. <laughs> and sometimes people say, well, we wanna leave the house um, unencumbered. I said, would you rather leave the house or would you rather leave them um, a portfolio of investments that far surpass that value? So that's what we've talked about today, Matt and Ed, is that incorporating reverse mortgages or housing wealth is reasonable, it's rational. I think it's appropriate and in the best interest of the client because of outcomes that may not otherwise be achieved if you don't look at the housing wealth because of all of these different things. So we just said liquidity management and mortgage management and tax management and long-term care management and reserve management and access to tax-free dollars. And that was just a tip of the iceberg. So I think it is absolutely reasonable. And I would be strong, but I don't want to go to my, I have a dream speech, which would say, I think it's criminal. We can edit this out, but if an advisor is looking at a client and he's a triple A or she's a triple A advisor, all available assets. Then you're looking at their income, their investments, their insurances. But what's that big asset <laughs> right in front of them? You have to incorporate housing wealth. And then you have to know, you have to have a cursory knowledge of the subject matter. So I'll land the plane there. Again, Ed Slot had me write a, a, a book here uh, two years ago. It's been great. And put that next slide up and then hand it back to Bob here, Matt that if you want that information here, um, housingwealthbook.com, there's an advisor's version and here's a consumer version and housing wealth videos. If you wanna see me unpack some of these concepts for consumers there. Okay, Matt. Anyway. Don, thank you so much. Just uh, a quick, quick thought is the last time you and I did a presentation like this, the very first person who called me, it was a live presentation after he hung up was my 43 year old brother who is a chemist, very educated. And he said, you're telling me that when I turn 62 and I retire, I wanna to move to Arizona. And Arizona has a lot higher housing values than in Jackson, Michigan, where I'm from. He said, you're telling me I can basically go buy a house at 50 to 60% equity, live where I wanna live and not have to make a payment? I said, that's absolutely what I'm telling you. Now he's been very astute and he's already converted all of his retirement plans to Roth IRAs. So he has literally already created a future tax-free lifestyle. Now he's 43, so he's got some time to 62. But there are so many different ways this can be used in so many different areas and so many different people. But there's four or five simple things. Generally speaking, I think the law says you have to be at least 62, one of the, one of the owners. Guess how old the second spouse needs to be? 18. But Jen, I prefer to have both of my clients at 62 if possible. You have to live in the house. You have to pay your property taxes. You have to maintain your homeowner's insurance. And you should try uh, not to let your house fall into utter disrepair. Those are not very hard rules to follow. So I want to kind of bring it back to the simplicity of a very complex and often misunderstood concept. And that is why we wanted to put this together uh, for all of you. And so... I would like to thank Bob for having us, and I'd like to thank Don for his time and insight, and 
Ed is the uh, the great uh, magnet that has really brought us all together. We all know each other because of Ed Slot. So I will turn it over to uh, Ed for a few comments and then maybe Bob, if there are a few questions. Well, yeah. I would actually turn it back to Don for the, the, the thing I got out of this when I first started revisiting reverse mortgages is to get those old stereotypes out of my head. And I think you should just do a quick wrap up. You're not gonna lose your house. Uh, as a matter of fact, Matt mentioned one, the ages of the spouse, uh, that uh, non-recourse loans without getting too technical and, and let people know that's, uh, you know, that's past history. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, a lot of things have changed in 33 years. There's no doubt. So the reverse mortgage, you, you don't give up ownership or come off title to your home. You're never going to be required to repay more than the home is worth because they all reverse mortgages are non-recourse loans. Um, they're greater spousal protections. One of the things when someone, I mean, you mentioned reverse mortgages and, and mixed company. You ever do that, Bob? You mentioned at the barbecue, three people leave the table, but but your aunt Janie made a shank out of a plastic knife and fork and came after you. I mean, it just gets dangerous. But but a lot of folk have um, outdated information. The Reverse Mortgage Stabilization Act of 2013 changes in 17, 18, and 19. And so the program is just much safer. It's applicable to so many people. The protections are immense. And whatever you thought it may have been, I promise you it's a lot different and the applications are a lot more vast than you imagine. You can't get this in a 60 second commercial by a TV personality. This was the AP course of this. And, and again, if you go and watch the videos or read that book, you don't have to read my book, but just read on some of the new things. Um, I, I just think if, there, if you're a homeowner and you're retiring, there's, there's no need for you. You can have a retirement that you may never have imagined and tax benefits um, that may have never been discussed. Thanks, Bob, Pal, for having me. You know, there's, and not only that, the, the bottom line is when you go into retirement, you want to be able to sleep at night, not worry about tax risk, investment risk, all these things that keep people up at night, especially with the volatility. You talk about the volatility buffer. That is a big deal. This is kind of a giant shock absorber that you don't have to worry about all the things most people in retirement worry about. Because in retirement, when the paychecks stop, that's when you're the most vulnerable. And who, uh, bottom line is every person I ever spoke, they wanna sleep at night. They don't, they wanna have less to worry about. And in a lot of ways, this accomplishes that. So gentlemen, I, I want, one, I wanna thank you, but I also had a few follow-up questions of my own. Um, some are basic and some might be more involved, but let me just start with the basic one. I, if uh, here we are, we're watching housing prices rise rapidly, but there are limits to the amount of money that you get from a reverse mortgage. Is that right, Don? That is. Uh, the reverse mortgage is going to make money based off of the age of the youngest borrower, value of the home, and the current interest rate. Now, most people know the most popular reverse mortgage, which is the home equity conversion mortgage um, under FHA. And the lending limit at the time of this recording is a little more than 822000 Dollars, But the jumbo reverse mortgage is one uh, fewer people know about, and that goes up to home values $10 million. And so I had a retired CEO of a large multinational pharmaceutical company that he had a four, he had $5 million in assets under management and a four and a half million dollar home down to Jersey Shore. And they were looking to do a reverse mortgage. Why? Because he had $2.1 million in mortgages and loans on his property. Debt servicing was $21,000 a month. And his advisor called and said, is there a reverse mortgage that could get rid of the debt servicing? The answer was yes. And so a reverse mortgage uh, worked for him. La Jolla, California, person had $4 million in a tax liability to the IRS. And they were going to pull that out of their qualified dollars in Northern California. Oh, imagine the tax hit on that. And they called and said, Don, is there a reverse mortgage that will cover $4.1 million? I said, yes, he's got a $10 million home. There's a reverse mortgage for that. And so depending on the, um, the type of program, reverse mortgages can go um, fill the gamut. So the FHA loans have a limit, but the jumbos don't have a limit. All right. And then um, we often tell people that uh, one of the best retirement income strategies is to delay claiming Social Security till age 70. 
but if they don't have the funds to, well, and, and that that should maybe consider a bridge strategy, either withdraw money from their IRA to cover what they would have received from Social Security. But using a reverse mortgage also fills that that uh, that that bridge gap. Sure, uh, Mad Ned can speak to that because I would always say consult your tax advisor. But one of the one of the things that I think any person would want to know is that if I got a reverse mortgage today, hey, can you send me Matt or Ed or somebody, send me those three columns, A, B, and C, so at least I could know um, what could be bridged. So absolutely, there's a bridging strategy. Does it make sense? I don't know. You have to look at um, kind of your other resources and what you have, because a reverse mortgage, Bob, is not always going to be the conclusion of the matter, but I absolutely believe it should be part of the conversation. Now, now I'll let Matt and Ed um, speak to that as well. I would echo the same thing. And I have used it with dozens of clients for exactly that strategy. Maybe they already had done their planning and they had prepared for future chronic illness or long-term care with other resources or hybrid life insurance. And they weren't like Bob and Sally, they both qualified. So that was already a peace of mind thing. And now they said, look, we have an aunt who's 95 and we have an uncle who is 93 and we have longevity in our family and we'd like to max out our social security benefit um, and so statistically their families, you know, they should live a long time, uh, and they had good health. So we said, okay, we need to look at some creative strategies. Now they had enough assets that they could draw their portfolio down in those early years, but that wasn't the best tax strategy. We went and looked at a reverse mortgage and did this bridging and those were tax free dollars. Their portfolio kept growing. So they actually had more assets by the time they were 70. Then we flipped the switch on social security. Now they had more income than they've ever had and all at very low tax uh, tax brackets. And so, Ed, if you have any comments to add on that, I mean, I've had great experiences with that. Well, I th again, nothing's for everybody, but everybody should have this conversation because uh, if they have equity in their home and they're not using it, they're not getting the most out of any kind of financial plan. And using IRA assets to hold off Social Security, remember, that's a taxable event. So anytime you can avoid taxes, you're in probably better shape. You could use the reverse mortgage. Then maybe when Social Security turns on, you can use that reverse mortgage, as we said, to pay the taxes that then uh, maybe on RMDs, required minimum distributions, or for Roth conversions after that. But everybody should at least address getting the most out of the assets they've built up over a lifetime. Uh, my other question is, a lot of folks... Um, maybe they're empty nesters, they're living in a too big a house and they want to downsize. There's the ability to use the reverse mortgage to purchase a downsized house too. Absolutely. The National Association of Realtors um, just a week and a half ago talked about the number of retirees who are moving and it's a huge number. A lot of things that people don't know is that uh, part of the Homeowner Economic and Recovery Act of 2008, a whole new reverse mortgage was incorporated into that, which was the reverse for purchase. And Bob, that allows uh, a retiree to buy their next home with 50 to 60% down and have no monthly mortgage payments. So um, I had a client that moved from a $535,000 home. They paid off their mortgage. They had $400,000 left over. They moved to a $300,000 home. And the realtor said, well, just pay cash. And I said, you could do that, but what if you need the money out later and can't get it or what if home values decline is that the best place to lock up your proceeds is in brick and mortar so they got a reverse mortgage watch this they had a three hundred thousand dollar home they were buying that was appropriate for their last home and so the reverse mortgage made fifty percent hundred fifty thousand dollars available so their down payment was hundred fifty thousand dollars even though they had proceeds of four hundred so they bought a new house um that was appropriate for them for 150 down. And they had $250,000 left over to repurpose for their retirement income. So that works for um, upsizing and it works for downsizing. It's just a new type of reverse mortgage that many don't know about. And I'll use construction terms. I used to be president of Habitat for Humanity here in Philadelphia. It's a way to rehab your retirement. You like that, Matt? I do. I had a quick comment on that too. Uh, in real, real world examples of upsizing, many, many times clients of mine, as they get into retirement, their adult children have grown up 
they're not working. They've gone to other states. They've gone to other states, Colorado, New York, Arizona, where real estate might be more expensive than where the parent lived. And what do they want to do? They want to be by their grandkids. But to go buy an identical sized house in an up market, you know, the cost is, is there. And so someone who sells a house in Jackson, Michigan for $300,000 can't necessarily take 300 grand and buy what they want in a traditional sense in Colorado and Denver. And so I've had many cases where that has also come up and that's been a way to upsize, be around the family, not have a payment and have their retirement income plan still work exceedingly well because they don't have that monthly outflow. Mm -hmm. So I, I have two last thoughts. One is um, the, the phrase reverse mortgage has all sorts of connotations in, I believe in Europe, they, there's another name, perhaps more palatable name for um, what's for this notion of reverse mortgage. Um, it doesn't come to me off the top of my head, but you might know it, Don. Uh, you know, uh, one country had the name scheme. I didn't think that was good. <laughs> <laughs> but but when you think about Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Austria, uh, Scotland, Switzerland, China, um, there's 17 other countries that have reverse mortgages, many of them dating back to the end of um, the 1800s. Mm. So the U.S. Was, was, was late on that. But there was an interesting... Um, um, a blind taste test done by the industry a few years ago because the thought was, oh man, we should get rid of reverse mortgages. And I've been saying it 21 years. And so they, they brought people in a room. It's a wonderful uh, case study. And I have a short video, Matt's seen it. And they say to people, let's talk to you about home equity lines of credit. And they describe them both. And they say, now here's what they do. Which one would you choose? And I think it was 89% of the people chose home equity line of credit B and they revealed to them what it was. Well, this is a traditional home equity line of credit, and this is a reverse mortgage. And it was 89 people, 89% uh, <laughs> chose a reverse mortgage when they didn't know the name. And But when they knew the name, they said, would you consider a reverse mortgage? And they said, oh, no, I've never considered that. But then they removed the name and just said the benefit. And so the industry thought, maybe we'll re remove the name, but it's, it's we didn't, and it's kind of stuck here. Here's what I say to folk. I said, um, if you're a financial advisor, not everybody listening is, but I say, don't use the word reverse mortgage and polite company. Say new, use the word new, the new reverse mortgage, because it is, it's 33 years old or, or 60, depending on the proprietary one. Say new reverse mortgage or, or, or newly restructured reverse mortgage, and that will um, soften it and it'd be absolutely true. But the concept of using your housing wealth to strengthen your retirement plan if we can get people over the hurdle into um, some conversation, all the outcomes are beautiful when that happens. So if this webinar wasn't enough for someone to at least think about reverse mortgages for their retirement income plan, um, no less a person than Robert Merton, who won a Nobel Prize, says there are just two products that will guarantee the retirement security of most middle Americans. One is an annuity and the other is a reverse mortgage. So. Uh, if it's good enough for Bob Merton, the Nobel Prize winner, I think it should be good enough for um, our audiences in addition to this webinar. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you, uh, gentlemen. If Any last words before we wrap up? Bob, thank you so much. It looks like Ed uh, is going to unmute. This has been phenomenal. It's been a great collaboration. And, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to help push this information out there. And, and I think your audience will see the excitement that we have. And then I have every time I get to do an illustration with Don and, and open someone's eyes up to what is out there and they're just blown away because of that, that bad word, I guess we'll say up front. So thank you, Ed. Well, I might change the name, Don, and you or Matt, one of you said this, do you have a triple A? I think you said you have a triple A advisor, but I would even say, would you want a triple A plan? And that the natural question, what's that? Of course I want a triple A. Why would I? I don't want a single A. I don't want a double A. I want a triple A. What is that? All available assets. I wrote that down when you said that. Uh, one of you said triple A advisor, but maybe we call the plan a triple A plan. You're using all available assets. Outstanding. Hey, Robert Powell, I'd just like to thank you for the phenomenal work that you continue to do with um, home equity and retirement. I've just been a, and the articles that you write, I'm just a fan. I'm glad to have been invited to this. Thank you for um, having me and the work you continue to do. 
Thank you, Don, and, and, and Matt, and Ed, it's truly my pleasure to, um, to share your knowledge and wisdom with our audience.